How's it going? Everyone rocking? Great. It's an exciting time, isn't it? Um, what an incredible couple of weeks. Um, you'll have noticed that we have uh, started to share something of vision without a million point plan of how it's going to work. And that is an intentional decision. It's intentional because we want to invite the church, all of us, to be part of this journey. There are two ways to approach vision. The one is that we come onto the stage and say, this is where we're going, follow us, get in line. The other is to go, we are the people of God, here's what we feel God's saying, let's seek him for the means and the wherewithal to get to where he's calling us. And so we ask, will you stand with us in prayer as we declare these things? You know, when Mark shared his word, it was so, it was liberating for us as a team. These things bubbling away in the background and well, like, we sense God's doing this, sense God's doing that. And then Mark shared this word, this prophetic word, and it was liberating for us because it was like he unlocked something of what God was already doing. It was a confirmatory word. It wasn't a revelatory word. It was something that we went, oh, God's grace to us. God's grace to us, like he was unlocking something so that we could step into what God had for us. So it's an exciting time where we want everyone to be part of the journey. And uh, the second thing I wanted to say about that is, you know, Andrew spoke last week about going down to Freedom Center and a, a vision statement about a building couldn't be less about a building. You know, when he was saying the great makeover, I was just thinking about, the, you know, these wonderful makeover programs. I was thinking about the people of God. We were thinking about the people of God, that he's transforming us into what he's called us to be, that he's making something new. And so um, whilst it's a, you know, there's a, a visionary statement that's specific... The overarching vision for this is a heart. It is the heart that we as a church will be galvanized around our unique purpose in this unique place. Are you excited about that? Yeah. Like, like that God is fusing us together in this time for a purpose. And this was a visionary statement from Andrew. And I thought he was incredible last week as he delivered uh, what he felt God had placed on our hearts. So, should we just pray? Father, we're so grateful to you. Lord, you, you use us despite us. You love us. Even in your wisdom, you love us. You draw us, your people. You lead us. You go before us. Lord, your presence is with us. We're so encouraged. Lord, I'm so encouraged to be part of something where we get to hear your voice. And obediently follow you, even if we don't know what the next steps look like, that we know we're stepping into you and into all that you have for us as a church. Father, I pray today as we start to look again at the ancient roots of the Apostles' Creed, that there'd be something of you revealed uh, in your word today that we can grab hold of and just be uh, amazed by. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to know that you're with me this morning. Um, we, are, we are back into the Ancient Roots series. And we've got the next three weeks where we're going from some vision statements about the church local. And we're going on to um, some vision statements really about what the church is meant to be. What is the church? And uh, really, we're on to this, this section that says, we believe, there's this declaration in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church and in the communion of the saints. And my job this morning to go, how on earth can we say that we believe the church is holy? Have a look at the church universal the press reports that you, you see, how is it we can say the church is holy? 
was like a hush of embarrassment in the room. But it's true, isn't it? The church is like full of human people who are broken and sinful and difficult. And how can we say the church is holy? So I've got um, a job to do today to get through a reasonable chunk of Scripture and a reasonable chunk of the Bible to take us on a bit of a journey and explain how we can say that the church is holy. And I want to start in a fearful place. You know, I, I, let me start here and, and say this. There is no other scriptural word like the word holy. It is by far the most divine. It is, it is, it is a word that seeks to explain something, something of the unexplainableness of the divine God. It's a paradox in itself. Putting something of the character of God into language is a paradox. It's something difficult. Um, Andrew Murray uh, says this, There is not in Scripture a word more distinctly divine in its origin and meaning than the word holy. There is not a word that leads us higher into the mystery of deity, nor deeper into the privilege and blessedness of God's children. You know, the word holy means other than. It almost means unexplainable. It means different. It means separate from. The word holy is in itself an explanation of the divine. So I'm focusing on this otherness concept. And I want to start here today in 2 Samuel 6. And this story is a story of a dude called Uzzah. Okay? And I don't know if you know <laughs> the story at all, but it's a fearful story. And so I've called this first section Fearful Otherness. Because I like to start with the problem. And the problem of holiness is that it is so separate from us that we can't even be in the vicinity of it. And that's a problem, isn't it, when you think about it? And uh, there's this story of Uzzah and a journey that was made with the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what the Ark of the Covenant was? It, it was one of, there were holy articles in the Tent of Meeting. And, and the Ark of the Covenant is one of them. And there's this story of David who gathers some of his men and they get a cart and they decide to move the Ark of the Covenant on a cart to basically go back with David. And so him and this bunch of men and a cart and Uzzah, and they're on the way on a journey and the oxen stumbles and the cart's going to fall and Uzzah puts his hand out to stop the Ark from falling and he drops down dead for touching the ark. Can you see the problem? It's a difficult text, isn't it? It's like, how can a loving God... Uzzah reached out, it says in 2 Samuel 6, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. And the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act... Therefore God struck him down, and he died beside the ark of God. Then David was angry with the Lord's wrath, that the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. Goes on to say, David was afraid, and it's, he, he said, how can I take this ark back? And the ark stayed in the house of a guy called Obed-Edom. And then it's, it, it says at the end of the chapter, and the house of, and household of Obed-Edom was blessed. This is tricky. Okay? Just, I want you to engage with the trickiness of Uzzah dropping dead. Can anyone relate to David's anger? Yeah. There's something in us, isn't there, that goes, hang on. But we are told in, in Romans when we read Romans 22 and 23, now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For, trips off the tongue, 
The wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There was, for Uzzah, who had had some time with the ark in his presence, an over-familiarity maybe, maybe a complacency in the presence and the holiness of God. Maybe there was a, just a, a negligence, or maybe he was just sincerely trying to help, but kind of forgot what it was all about. But there's a little bit more to the story than you see in 2 Samuel 6. The story goes a bit deeper in that God had given the Israelites very specific instructions about the moving of the ark. If you go back to Numbers 4, you see that uh, God has instructed, instructed that the Kohathites be the only people that was uh, one of the sons of Levi, the only people to transport the holy articles were the Kohathites. So they were the dudes that could carry the stuff, and they couldn't carry the stuff on carts. They were told, you must carry all the holy articles between poles, and the Kohathites must carry the tent of meeting holy articles from one place to another on poles, and they were Levites. They were priests. The tribe of Levi were priests in the house of God. So God gave very specific instructions about the moving of the holy articles, which David point-blank refused. He took a bunch of his guys. They moved the ark on a cart. No mention of a Kohathite. No mention of a Levite. There there was some distinct disobedience in the way David moved things. Now, I want this to illustrate something. The specificness of the law in the Old Testament is meant to be a picture of the perfection of the holiness of God. It's meant to describe to us the character and nature of of God, and that is fearful. Because the thing about the law... (laughs) I I love this. I've done a few things in Highlands kitchens. And on the wall, it says, we strive for perfection, but excellence will do. And you see, the trouble with the law is, it's we strive for perfection, but perfection will do. And anything, anything less than perfection is death. That's the picture of the law. The otherness of God. The fearful otherness of God. Are you with me? It's tough, isn't it? But I want to move on. I want to move on to Isaiah, who has an encounter with God. There's already a shift here. Has an encounter with God in the throne room of God. I'm going to read it because it's just incredible. Uh, It says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. This is Isaiah. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away. And your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And I said, Here, is, here I am, Lord, send me. Now I want, to, I want to go back to the original picture of Uzzah and go, just wow, the holiness of God, the otherness of God. 
And then this picture of Isaiah, who was the dude. I mean, he was, he was destined in God to be the mouthpiece of God. And the interesting thing is, he comes into the presence of God, and he sees God. Behold, I saw the king, high and lifted up. And um, <clears throat> just the fact that we have a record of Isaiah saying, I saw the king, and yet he stayed alive, is an illustration of a, a development of God that he, in his utter holiness, is utterly merciful. Okay? Now, Uzzah got, actually he got justice. I'm going to argue that. If you miss the law by one tiny bit, the wages of sin are death. If you miss the law by one bit, the wages of sin are death. So Uzzah got justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. So if the law is the standard, breaking it deserves death, Uzzah got justice. Isaiah got mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Isaiah is in the presence of God, experiencing the holiness of God, and he was not killed. In fact, he was granted release from his sin. Now, grace is being given what you don't deserve. Grace is another step further forward. One of the things that strikes me about this text about Isaiah is this, that the, the seraphim flies down with this burning hot coal. Because Isaiah, can you imagine? He's fallen to his knees. He's gone, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. That's what he recognizes. I'm a man of unclean lips. And the seraphim touches his lips with a coal and purifies him. And then the first thing that happens is that God sends Isaiah out as a mouthpiece. Have you ever thought about that? The exact area of the confessed brokenness of Isaiah in the presence of God was the exact area that because of God's merciful redemption, God used him in. What an incredible dynamic. Maybe one to hold on to when you think about your own brokenness. Maybe it's possible that God in his mercy redeems us in the area of our brokenness and brings out life and treasure and actually fruit for the kingdom. Is that a possibility? And so I want to just develop this a little bit further and move on to grace and, and really that was the merciful otherness of God. This right here is the gifted otherness of God. The gifted otherness of God. The otherness of God that is gifted to us. And I'm going from one throne room experience, and bear with me, I'm jumping a lot here, but you try the holiness of God in 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm jumping from one throne room experience to another throne room experience, where in Hebrews 4, says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he is without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I, I, I just want to capture something of the beauty of this scripture. In the Old Testament and according to the law, there was a high priest. The high priest's role was he was... He was the man that God had appointed, a Levite, 
to stand in the gap between the people of God in their position and the holiness of God. He was like the bridge. He was allowed to be in the Holy of Holies, that was the dwelling place of the ark in the temple, once a year. And on his entrance into the Holy of Holies, he'd have a rope tied around his ankle in case he died in the presence of God. But he was the high priest. Now in this scripture, it is saying that Jesus has become our high priest and he's the perfect high priest because he's bridged the whole gap. And what he's done is he's thrown the doors of the Holy of Holies open to God's people and he's saying, come now with boldness into the throne room that Isaiah experienced. I just want you to grasp that for a second. This is the essence of what Jesus has done. We've gone from the fearful otherness of God to a place where because of God's mercy and his grace, he's provided Jesus as a high priest, an intercessor, a stand in the gap. He's the great high priest for all time. He has opened up the way, the veil has been torn in two, and the Holy of Holies is a place now of dwelling for us, God's people, in the holiness of God, the gifted holiness of God. We don't deserve that, do we? In fact, we're in the same place as the Israelites, we're in the same place as us, probably worse. We, you know, what the wages for sin are death, we deserve that, that's justice. God, first of all, was merciful. He sent his son and he's extended, he's gifted holiness to us through his son. That's grace. We've been given something we don't deserve. Let me hear an amen. Thank you. Sorry. The TD Jakes there for you. So we've got access into the Holy of Holies. Now I want to take this one step further. Another ridiculous jump. And I want to talk about otherness as an identity. Right. So the otherness of God has been gifted to us. We don't deserve it. We can't come. But Jesus is the great high priest. Now the holiness of God. We're not just invited in. We're not just gifted a place in the Holy of Holies. No, no. Because of Jesus, God has made holiness our identity. You cut you through to the core. You see, the thing is, right, you look inwardly, and what you see often is the sin and the difficulty and the problem with this. And when God looks upon you who have received Jesus, what he sees is perfection and holiness. It's a massive problem in our minds because because we can't comprehend it. How can we say that the church is holy? Well, this. Hebrews 10, 14 says this. For by one sacrifice, he has perfected forever those who are being made holy. So you could read that. For, one ba- for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect, or he has made holy forever, those who are being made holy. How does that work? This is the climax of the story of the redemptive power of God, who knew that we were distant and broken and not perfect, and has planned, I'm not going to pretend to know the mind of God, but has planned to redeem broken humanity to share his DNA in his holiness. This is the climax from from 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them as he had committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. (laughs) How? How? What a story. What a beautiful gospel we have. What we carry as God's people, so much greater than the Ark of the Covenant. The treasure that is the gospel. For God did not count people's sins against them, but instead, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. When you look on the internal and you believe in an identity statement that says you are anything other than holy, you agree with the brokenness of sin, but God calls you to agree with your new identity, an identity that says you are holy as God's people. It, look, it can't be anything less than that. It can't be, I'm, I'm mostly holy. You just don't get to be mostly holy. Mostly, mostly holy is not holy at all. Holy is an imputed, that means God has by his grace valued you as, he has given to you the identity stamp of holy. This is so key for how you live out the gospel, how we live out what we're called to do. And my friend um, in South Africa told me a story, and it, well, not a very good story, but it's a simple story. Uh, he basically tried to explain what it, why we keep going around the same patterns of behavior. And he said, look, if you get to the front door of your house on a day-to-day basis, and you believe that you're mucky and covered in, in just the gunk of your own decision and the world, when you step into your driveway, if it's full of puddles, you'll just walk through them. Because what difference does it make? But he says, if you knew that you were dressed completely head to toe in Daz Ultra white, like a Benny Hinn-esque, you would do everything you possibly could to avoid the filth in front of you. You see, our behavior often is dictated by what we believe our identity is. And our behavior follows what we believe our identity to be. But God has given you a new identity this morning. Whatever you've come here with, whatever you think is your DNA print, when you receive Jesus, your DNA print is the righteousness of God and no less. The caveat is this, and it says this, he's perfected forever those who are being sanctified, right? So there's, a, there's something to empathize there. We recognize we're on a journey of bringing into line everything about us as a person to match our DNA as God's people. Isn't that right? And let me tell you, God's ner- mercy is new every morning, okay? You walk in, you feel rubbish, you're carrying the weight, that's fine. You can come to God and go, I'm carrying the weight. But you must, if you understand the gospel, say, my identity is holiness. And so, you know, we're going to respond as the church. We're going to respond. Um, and, I, you know, I, I want to welcome you, whoever you are. Um, but we're going to respond by taking communion And communion is for anyone who would say, even in this moment right now, that Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my salvation. And so we're gonna we're gonna respond in a very practical way. I I like I like practical things that I can get my teeth into. And I think what I what I'm asking of you is as we worship, um, I want us to 
it, it, not right now, but if you, if you agree with what I'm about to say, I want you to stand. And as we walk to the table, as you walk, your steps are a reflection on the holiness of God. Because it's still true that his holiness is fearful. It's majestic. It's beyond our comprehension. My pathetic attempt to explain something is not worthy of the holiness of God. It is still other than. As we walk, we are recognizing I have fallen short of the holiness of God. It's a recognition of that. And as you take bread and wine as an individual reflection, you are recognizing this is the other thing. I am holy because of Jesus. I am holy because of Jesus. So there's two reflections there. As you're walking up is to say, I recognize that God is other than. He is holy. And as you take the bread and the wine, you're saying, my new identity is holiness, is righteousness. The old is gone, the new has come. So I'm going to ask the ministry team to come and stand at the various stations. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you are in agreement with that and you want to come and break bread together right now. And I'm just going to I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to ask everyone who stood as that reflection to move to the table and be conscious of what you're doing. You're saying, God, I recognize that your holiness, your otherness, I can't comprehend. And then as you take the bread and wine, you're saying, God, I recognize that my new identity because of Jesus is holiness. Okay, so I'm just going to pray. Father, thank you so much for your church. Lord, we believe that your church is holy. And Jesus, we, we receive your freely given gift of grace that puts a new imprintation on us. Not only that, actually, it's no longer the old that lives, but it's you who live through us. And so as we break bread, Father, I pray, we really engage with the big picture of this beautiful gospel that despite your otherness and your holiness, you welcome us into the throne room of grace with boldness because of the stamp that Jesus has put on us, a new identity of holiness in Jesus' name.